few weeks ago, I was invited to a party by one of my old friends. Since we had all become adults with busy lives, we barely got together anymore. It had been at least two years since all of our high school group had been in one spot at the same time. The most well off of the group, Greg, had a place on the beach. It was a pretty decent sized place and I shuddered to think about how much he paid for it, but it was kind of him to offer it up for the weekend. None of us could pass up the chance to relax and party. By the time I got to his place, it was packed. Most people had brought a plus one or a plus two. There were a lot of unfamiliar faces, but I was quickly introduced and started to get along with my old friend's new partners. Mostly, everyone was drinking and music was playing, but it wasn't like a college party or out of control riot. That disappointed one person, Stephen. We all liked Stephen in our own way, but everyone could only deal with him for so long. I arrived late to Greg's place, and by the time I arrived, Stephen was already drunk. He was badgering the other guests in ways only he could. So, Greg kindly asked Steve to go for a walk on the beach and see if he could find any cool shells. I only saw Stephen for a few minutes before he was off on his treasure hunt. Catching up with everyone else was a good time. I listened, mostly because since college, I didn't really have much going on. I hadn't made any effort in dating and just started to work most of the time to pay off my student loans. But my old friends enjoyed having someone to talk to about their new adult lives and appreciated me just listening. As time ticked by, Greg got a little bit worried. He was too quiet. He did want a break from Stephen, but he had been gone for too long. The sun was going to set and he worried he may have passed out on the beach or was harassing someone else. Because I'd spent less time with Stephen, I didn't mind him, so I took the bullet and volunteered to go and find him. If I couldn't find him while walking the beach, and if no one could reach him on his phone, we would get more serious about looking. The walk along the beach was nice. I was glad to get out for a little while. I did like seeing all my friends, but with being as busy as I was, I never got to just take a walk and enjoy my surroundings. Greg had worked hard to be where he was in life. I hope he took the time to take walks like this. Just listening to the waves and smelling the salty air. I almost hoped I didn't find Stephen, but around a pile of rocks, right near the end of the beach before it turned into a cliff, he was standing, looking at something. As I got closer, I thought I would figure out what he was looking at, but I had no idea. I'd never seen anything like it before. Oh hey, Stephen said, looking over at me, when he noticed me walking up. His speech was a little bit slurred, I think his discovery had sobered him up a little. What even is that? I asked him, hoping he had any idea. What we were looking at was a cube. It came to about my waist. It was transparent and looked like it was made of clear gelatin. It did sort of look like a clear block of ice. Aside from mine and Stephen's footprints, there were no tracks that explained how we got onto the beach. Maybe the sea washed on shore. I don't know, it doesn't feel cold. Some sort of jello? Stephen asked. Before I could stop him, he reached out a hand and slapped the thing. It made a squishy wet sound and rippled slightly. Not as much as I expected. I honestly didn't think it was the best idea to touch the thing. Who knew what chemicals it was covered in? Or where it even came from? A smart person wouldn't touch it with their bare hands, but Stephen was far from smart. He was our dumbest friend. And we, in a way, liked him because of that, even if it got annoying really fast. I'm going to put my dick in it. Stephen's words caught me off so off guard, I couldn't speak for a few seconds. This was beyond Stephen Dunn. The idea was just gross. It made my ears turn red, even though I usually don't get embarrassed easily. What? No! Why would you- I was sputtering. Why would you do that? You don't even know what it is. He smiled at me with a drunken gleam in his eyes. It was hard to tell if he was kidding or just wanted to mess with me. When his hands reached for the waistband and his cargo shorts, my hands shot up over my eyes in disgust. Dude, don't be a gross jerk. You don't even know if it's safe to touch it. I heard him cackle over my discomfort and kept his shorts on. It's just some weird jello stuff. It's not some alien goo. Here, look. He shot out his arm and shoved it into the clear cube. The mass parting like slime letting Stephen's arm sink inside. 
Being the overgrown child he was, he kept squishing his arm in and out, making lewd sound, laughing. I was not impressed at all. I considered just leaving him and even started to walk away, when a scream made me stop. Stephen's face was twisted in horror as he was pulling on his arm, looking like he was unable to remove it. My good nature got the better of me. Not considering it was another joke, I ran over and hooked my arms under his to try and pull it back. Yo dude, it's a joke, Stephen answered laughing at my worry and shrugged me off. He started to pull his arm out, but stopped right below the elbow. I wanted to hit him for making me worried like that, but I only scowled. He was a jerk, but he was still our friend. Stephen only had a crooked grin on his drunk face for a few seconds. He kept pulling on his arm, but his look started to fall. He pulled and tugged, and even though I was just pranked, I started to get worried. Are you stuck? I asked while watching him struggle, still standing behind him ready to help. No, it's like a... Uh, that suction thing. If I wiggle, I can just... I watched as he wiggled and struggled to get his arm free of the cube. When asked for help, I was ready to jump in and start tugging again. But if that didn't work, I didn't know what else we'd to do. I wasn't going to touch the cube and I didn't have my phone on me. I was just using it for directions to get here and it died. I asked Greg to plug it in for me as soon as I walked in and didn't grab it on my way out to find Steven. I would have to leave him here to get help. Hang on, I got it. With one final grunt of effort and one great pull, Steven got his arm free of the cube. Mostly free. I heard a sickening, wet ripping sound as his arm came out, but it left part behind. I had heard the term deed loved for a workplace safety video, but because the images were so gruesome, they never showed us photos. Deed loved was a word I never hoped I had to use or ever have to see. The shock hit him before any pain. Stephen stared down at his red arm, layers of skin removed, starting under the elbow, unable to react. My stomach turned. Unable to help it, I turned away from him and lost all the contents of my stomach. Some went up through my nose and my eyes started to water from the pain, but I kept dry heaving. I was never able to deal with blood. Seeing such a bad injury was beyond something I could handle. I don't know if it was rage or pain, but Stephen started to scream shortly after I started to puke. I was facing away from him so I didn't see what he was doing and I couldn't stop him. I heard slapping sounds between his screaming, like a sound of someone hitting wet sand. The moment I was physically able, I stood up rubbing my eyes to look at him. I wanted to drag my friend back to the house to get him medical treatment. My dumb friend had different ideas. Stephen was kicking at the clear cube, screeching. The part of his arm that remained was dissolving inside and in a few seconds, it was gone. His foot was just bouncing off the cube and he must have thought it was safe because he was wearing sandals and his bare feet weren't touching the thing. I screamed at him to stop with my raw throat, but it was too late. With one final kick, his leg sunk in deep inside the cube. I grabbed him under the arms again, willing myself not to puke, and started to pull so scared and frantic to think of any better ideas. Somehow he had enough wiggle room to move, so he was face to face with me, foot still stuck. I didn't look at the cube. For him to turn like that, it might have done a number on his ankle. I feared it was already dissolved by the cube. Both of us screaming and yelling for help, he wrapped his arms around me, begging for me to save him. I pulled and used all my strength to try and get him away from that dangerous, man-eating object he was stupid enough to touch. Even if he lost a leg, maybe, if I was fast enough, he could be saved. My skin crawled where his bleeding and injured arm grasped me, but I refused to let go. I desperately wanted to pull him free and bring him back to Greg's house. I heard that Justin's friend, girlfriend, was studying to be a nurse. If I could just get him back, he'd be alright. I believed that until Stephen stopped screaming. I was sweating and shaking. I looked down at him to see an expression on his face that made me turn cold. He was smiling. It's alright, it doesn't hurt. Come with me. 
his arms tightened around my waist. Unable to stop him, I felt myself being dragged closer and closer to the cube. Both his legs at some points had been taken inside. I only saw up to his knees, and the cube started to drag more of him inside, and soon to be myself. All while he grinned like a maniac. I struggled, but I had already used up all the energy trying to save him. I was doomed unless someone came by and saw us, but I doubted anyone cared enough about Steven to come looking. After all, I hadn't actually been gone for very long. It was my turn to beg and plead. I sobbed, begging Steven to let me go. I clawed at his good arm, not able to bring myself to touch his skinned one even in that situation. Steven was gone. I knew that. I could no longer save him. His waist was inside the cube, the rest eaten away. I thought that was to be my fate, but something happened. His expression changed. Suddenly he let go, and with his good arm punched me as hard as he could in the face. My world went black for a few seconds. When I came to, I was on the ground, my friend with a scared yet relieved expression on his face. Run. It was his last word to me. Almost like the cube was angry at him for letting me go. The rest of his body was sucked inside and lost to any rescue. I crabbed walked away from it as fast as I could, head swimming and vision fading. My face pounded from where he let, where he hit me, but I was thankful for it. My eye would be black for some time. He really didn't hold back at all. I stared in horror as the last of Stephen was dissolved away. It gave me and the cube some distance. I was still positive it would somehow sense me and get to me. But instead of it coming to me, the cube now clear from eating away the last of my friend started to glide away on the sand. It went slowly towards the sea, touching the lapping waves. I didn't know what I was doing, but I felt a cray pull towards it. I stood up on shaking legs and started to follow it. It disappeared inside the sea, and yet I couldn't step my body from following. I walked and walked screaming at my body to stop. When I was waist deep in the sea, Stephen's face and his last word came to my mind. That snapped me out of whatever trance I was in. In a panic, I forced myself out of the water and started to run towards the house. When I got inside, I was so frantic, I tripped over the welcome mat and smashed my face against the shoe rack. It cut open my forehead and I was out again for a few minutes. The party had stopped worried about me. When I awoke enough, I began I begged someone to go and help Stephen. Greg had already called an ambulance for me, but I was ready to call for more help. I couldn't tell them the crazy story of the strange man-eating jello cube, so I made up a lie. I said Stephen was drunk, tried to go swimming and went under. I had tried to save him, but I was bad swimmer. Bad swimming was an understatement. I've never nearly drowned at least five times and drowned once. I had to get CPR and I was spitting up water and everything. They all knew this and knew why I could come running for help. To them, if I had tried to save them, they would have two drowned victims on their hands. And they did try and find them. I needed stitches for my forehead and because so many people saw me bash my face, none of the police officers thought Stephen had hit me. That we got into a fight and I drowned him. They brought the story of him being drunk and going swimming. I don't know if I could have ever held up under any questioning if they ever thought anything else. The reason why they so quickly accepted my explanation is because they already had six missing persons suspect suspected to have drowned. When I heard, I had to look into those. None of the cases reported seeing something strange. Just that their loved ones were swimming, then just gone. I hadn't learned anything to prove my strange existence, but then I started to look at different cases in the city over, and then the next. After hundreds of hours of researching and hundreds of missing persons cases, I could tell two things. If that clear cube was real, it was mo moving up and down the coast. Once it hit one town, at least 16 people went missing near and in the sea and it would move further down the coast to do the same thing in a different area. And the second thing I could figure out, there was more than one of those creatures, both on the east coast and the west coast had the same problem. 
I could tell there was at least six of these creatures. I don't know what they are. All I know is, if you see something strange on the beach, don't approach it. And be careful swimming. To my dearest Maggie, it's been a long and harsh winter. As the newly appointed sheriff, I've taken on a larger amount of responsibility than I'm used to. However, I shall persevere and push forward. But this job has seemed to age me several years. This is some strange things going on that I haven't figured out how to handle. A wild beast has been terrorizing the farmers and citizens. The livestock of over 13 families have been slaughtered. Having the entrails and viscera of the poor animals flung around, painting the fields and barns red with crimson. In all of my 30 years, I have yet to discover any predator that possesses the ability to rip open several heads of cattle in dead silence. It is an interesting phenomenon to say the least. As in all the cases, no noises or any sounds that would cause any alarm were reported, as if the creature responsible for these killings had some idea as to how avoid discovery. Actually, now that I have looked back at the reports, I do remember a farmer by the name of Peter Kentram, who told me about the night before his herd was attacked. He had heard a sound that he had naturally assumed was just a mountain lion claiming its territory. As the man rightfully thought all was right with the world, as everyone who lives in the area knows that the lions would never walk into a human settlement, but when he rose to do his morning chores, he discovered an absolute horror scene. The poor devil came to me as white as the snow and as shaken as a newborn in the dead of winter. Kentrum was, had said it sounded like the creature was in a tremendous amount of pain and suffering, as if it had been wounded and was being eaten itself. But as I had said, he had no cause for concern until the morning. I wish this was easier to solve, but the answer eludes me. Anyways, my dear Maggie, I have to end this letter to you, as I have some important business to attend you to. I love you, and I hope to see you soon. Yours forevermore, James. This was the first of five letters sent to one Margaret Hill, wife of Sheriff James Hill. I'll be 100% honest when these letters and this story came into my possession. I had almost wrote it off as a hoax, but the more I looked into the Kentwood and its people, the web of intrigue and the spide of curiosity had sank its fangs deep into the conspiracy part of my brain. These letters show the downward spiral of a man who was out of his elements and cracked under the pressure of being the sole law enforcer of a town who had never fully accepted him as an authority figure. James seems to have been a well-adjusted and educated man from Philadelphia, born in 1861 to French immigrants Ella and Pierre Hill. He fought and clawed his way to the top ranks of the Philadelphia Police Department, and after he married one Margaret Laurenthal, he felt the big city was not the right place to raise his ever-growing family, and decided to being the sheriff of a small town in the mostly wild and sparsely settled Southern Oregon Territory was a better and safer option of the two. The team and I are going to head out to the locations that are mentioned in the letters to see if we can get all the hard, ugly and most likely boring facts and attempt to separate them from the fantastical and amazing myths surrounding the disappearance of one James Hill and the massacre of a town of 200 people. Here's a helpful suggestion. If you ever happen upon a magical lamp, don't wish to have mind reading powers. You will regret it. If you don't want to just trust me, then listen to my story. On my first day with the powers, I was walking through the city and listening to different thoughts. To my relief, most of them weren't about me. People had their own lives and were mostly only concerned about living them. I heard things such as what they were going to do at work today, worries about the families and the like. Another thing I noticed was how the volume of a thought changed depending on a person's location. The closer they were, the louder their thoughts and vice versa. The main problem started when I got to my office. Based on what I had learned in the streets, my expectation was that the sound of thoughts would be reduced to a quiet backroom hum. But they didn't. They were as loud as they'd been when people were walking close to me. As I sat down and prepared for the day, I puzzled over why this was. 
Maybe there was a kind of echo effect that happened when one person was inside a building. Maybe business people just have louder thoughts. I then listened carefully to the thoughts that I was hearing. Please God let me die. I can't keep living like this. Why can't I move? Please someone help us. Those didn't sound like the thoughts of office workers. They sounded like the thoughts of people who were in the middle of some kind of distress or disaster. I immediately felt the need to assist them. But where were they? I got up from my desk and began moving around the office to try and locate these people. I walked over to the walls. When I did this, the thoughts seemed to get softer. I then circled around the floor in my office. The thoughts seemed to be louder the closer I was to my desk. Were they below me? I dropped to the floor and listened. No, that just made them softer. Confused, I returned to my desk. The thoughts got louder again. What was going on? Were they in my desk? I opened every drawer but found nothing. Then I leaned forward to look behind my computer. As I did, my head got very close to the picture I had of my family sitting beside me. The thoughts got louder than ever before. I quickly pulled my head back and stared at the picture. No, there was no freaking way. I picked up the picture and held it closer to my face. The thoughts got louder. I pushed it farther away from my face. The thoughts got softer. There was no doubting it. The thoughts were coming from inside the picture. I later removed all the pictures from my desk and tried to forget about it. I currently work as a cop in a pretty small town. It's surrounded by woods and parks. The forests are not part of any national park system, but I feel as if it's a big one. I have to be vague about the area because I don't think my boss would appreciate me talking about this case. It's still pretty big news considering nothing ever happens in this area. When a child goes missing in the woods, it should be big news. When two goes missing, it's more than news. I never told anyone the truth about what happened in those woods when I took a day looking for those children. I'm certain that if my boss heard any of this, he would strip me of my badge and send me off to the head doctor. I have to tell this in hopes I get any information about who I came across that day. I had an early midlife crisis and changed careers. I came from a long line of police officers and had planned that to be my future, but because of some complicated and boring reasons, I chose to do something else. Then, later on in life, I regretted my choices and did what I needed to become a cop. Even though I looked on the older side, I didn't actually have a lot of experience in law enforcement. The place that hired me didn't need someone who did, just a person who looked the part. Nothing happened in this small town, just some easy to break up bar brawls. Hell, they couldn't even be called brawls. I feel as if they only hired me so I could go through their ancient filing system and update it because my boss refused to do it. While I was organizing the mountain of old paperwork and cases I found out this town had a pretty regular pattern of hikers going missing on the trails. But after looking at the national average, I guess that our town wasn't anything special. Nothing sinister going on. People just get lost. I had only been working at my new job for six months when the uproar started. A child had gone missing on one of the easier and short hiking trails with his family. His father had turned his head to talk to his wife and when he looked back, his little boy was gone. He thought he just stuck behind a tree to just scare them. But after looking through the entire area, they grew panicked. The mother stayed where they last saw him, and the father ran to get help by the stranger's station. They quickly organized a search for the boy. The mother stayed in that spot for nearly 10 hours, waiting and watching, not knowing what else to do. I'm not a hiker myself, but I joined the volunteers and searched for the boy. Any spare moment I had, I was doing whatever I could to help. I ended up with hundreds of bug bites and torn ankles from my new boots, but I never complained. A child was out in the woods and we couldn't find any trace of him. Then a girl was lost. She asked a classmate of the boy and wanted to help. Some volunteers humoured her and let her run water to people searching. But she could only go for a few feet into the woods. If she saw someone coming near the trail end, she would run up and give them a cold water bottle. She was in sight the entire time. Again, 
Someone turned their head as soon as she took a step into the trail, and when they turned back, she was gone. The people who she had been walking towards hadn't turned their heads. They were completely bewildered and questioned what they had seen. She was simply gone in the blink of an eye. No one had a logical reason for it, so they didn't dwell on how the children disappeared, only that they now had two gone missing. Helip helicopters came and sent dogs during the search, but after a week the search was trying to recover a body. Two children under the age of 10 in the woods for that long weren't likely to last. I had been doing whatever I could in those days, but felt useless. My boss noticed how badly this case was on my health and forced me to take one day off. After all, I wasn't a hiker or an expert in cases like these. I'd done everything I could and I kept hiking. I'd burn myself out. He felt like there was more, even though people looked looking I could rest the day, and then got back at it full force. I didn't listen to him. I did go to bed early the night before so I could just be up at the crack of dawn to go back to the trails. I wasn't a part of the volunteer team, so my boss told them I shouldn't be out there. They gave me some looks, but let me go hiking as long as I promised to stay on the short trails and not go into the woods. Which I agreed. I could get lost and that wouldn't help anyone. I knew I wouldn't find any traces of the children on a trail that had been looked over at least a hundred times before. But I still just couldn't stay at home. That's how I spent my free day. Hiking trails and getting more blisters on my ankles. I had a backpack of some supplies. Even though I'd hiked for the entire day, I wasn't very hungry. I think the stress was getting to me. I still had some water and granola bars in my pack near the end of the day. I was in the office of a somewhat longer trail I had gotten permission to search on, and the sun had started to set. I decided to start heading back, but knew it would be dark by the time I arrived at the end of the trail, and to the ranger station in front of the woods. I knew I wasn't going to find anything, but I still felt disappointed ending the day empty-handed. The orange light of the sun had faded into a grey light. A strange grey light that made bright colours pop. I'd forgotten how strange that time of the day looked. My orange shirt nearly looked neon in the grey light. Because of the odd light, I saw a bright white on the trail easier than I might have at the different time of day. The trail had a slope to it. I had just reached the top ready to go down when I saw the white on the trail. I squinted to see a person standing wearing a long white and baggy sweater. The day had been hot and not all sweater weather. The person was short and my heart started to race but this person didn't look short enough to be seven. But it was still very strange to see a preteen just standing in the middle of the trail. I went down the slope and towards them hoping I looked friendly and they didn't bucket into the woods. Hey, are you alright? I asked when I was a few steps away from them. At first, I thought they'd been wearing a long white hat of some sort, but when I got closer, I saw their hair was pure white. Either this was a very short older person, or this child dyed their hair. I noticed they weren't wearing any shoes and found that strange. Their feet weren't dirty from walking in the woods and I didn't see any abandoned shoes around the trail. I had no idea how they went bare feet without tearing up their soles. Hearing my voice, they turned towards to face me. They were a child like I first thought. Their hair fell over their face, making it hard to see their face. I guessed they were a boy, even if I had hair on the long side. Alarm bells were ringing just at the back of my head, but I couldn't ignore a lost child in the middle of the woods. I'm a cop, you're safe. My name is Hugh. I was carrying my badge in my backpack and held it out for the boy to see. The boy still hadn't spoken or recited it in the slightest, but at least he was looking at the showing he was listening. Are you lost? Where are your parents? I asked as gently as I could. I couldn't blame the boy for being scared of a random man coming up to him in the woods. I hoped he trusted me enough to bring him to the ranger station so we could get help. We had to find out where the boy's family were and make sure he wasn't in any kind of trouble. Protective instincts, I didn't even knew I had, were kicking in. I asked to carry him out of the woods to make sure he wouldn't hurt his feet walking, but getting any closer to the kid would be a win. Best not to make him too comfortable. He hadn't responded to any of my questions, so I got down on his level to keep trying. What's your name? Ellie? 
I finally got something out of him. His voice was so soft I could barely hear it. But I had a name. I'm going to the ranger station. How about you come with me? If you feel comfortable with it, we could hold hands so we don't get lost. I saw his hands fidget a little at the end of his large sweater as his eyes darted back and forth considering what I had asked. Because I had gotten d down a bit lower, I could see his eyes through his white hair. His hair wasn't dyed. He was albino, judging by his pink reddish eyes, a rare condition I had never seen in person before. Put his hand to let me take it. He seemed like a shy kid. So I didn't push any more conversation and took my small win. When we started to walk, I kept an eye on the ground, making sure I was guiding him away from anything that might harm his feet. I wish I'd brought an extra pair of socks that day. Ellie was very light-footed though. He carefully walked around twigs on tiptoes as if it was second nature to him. I remember not wearing shoes as a child, so maybe he just adjusted without them. I wished I had a way to leave and know where I found him. If his parents were nearby, they would be worried. But I assumed they would go where we were headed once they couldn't find him. I had my phone on me, and I was glad it still had a charge. Still, holding Ellie's hand, I tried to unlock my phone with one hand. It had frozen, which I thought was weird. It had never frozen before. I tried to restart it and my lock screen came back on. But the clock remained the same time it was when I first checked it. The sun still hadn't set and my phone clock wasn't moving. I wanted to call the station saying I found Ellie, but no matter what I tried, my phone just refused to work. I shoved it into my pocket to try and use it again at a different time. As we walked down a slope, I got hit with a deja vu. I thought I'd already walked down this slope. In fact, I just found Ellie at the bottom, but I ignored it. The woods all looked the same to me. I could just be getting confused by my surroundings in the dark. I was never a good hiker. But when we hiked up another slope and came down again, I was seriously starting to think a tree growing on top of a boulder was the same one we'd just passed by. My throat was starting to get dry and panic was rising in my chest. Why did everything look the same? Why had the sun not set yet? And why would my phone clock not move? I pushed these worries down until we passed by the same tree growing on top of the boulder a third time. I didn't want to stress out Ellie who had silently been walking beside me the entire time. Ellie, could you do me a favour? I don't mean to worry you, could you stand right there as I look over that slope ahead of us? I just want to look ahead. I swear I won't leave you. The boy gave me a nod and it looked like he didn't want to let go of my hand. But he let it go and I half jogged up the trail to the small hill in front of us. When I started to walk away, Ellie had crouched over and started to shove sticks in the dirt. When I saw at the top of the hill, it gave me tunnel vision. I thought I was going to faint. I stood staring at Ellie, crouched over playing with sticks. I looked behind me and saw the same thing. This couldn't be happening. I had to be seeing things. Maybe Ellie had a twin and they were messing with me. I jogged down and walked over to the tree I was using as a landmark. I put my useless phone on top of a root. Ellie was staring at me and I gave him a smile. Humor me, I told him, and started up the slope again. When I reached the top, Ellie still had his line of sticks. But I felt a weight in my pocket. My phone was no longer on the tree root. It had returned to my pocket. What the hell? I asked slowly to myself. I had to be going crazy. Maybe the stress had finally gotten to me. I couldn't be stuck in a loop. These things just didn't happen. I walked down and stopped in front of Ellie, wondering what my face looked like in that moment. If this was really something, then Ellie might know something. After all, when I found him, the loop started. But I wasn't ready to put any blame on him yet. I'm going to climb a tree, I said, hands on my hips. A hint of a smile flickered on Ellie's face. I had no idea what else to do. Clearly, I couldn't walk along the trail without getting brought back. But I wasn't about to risk going into the woods. I would get put back on the trail or get lost in the trees. Maybe, just maybe, if I climbed high enough, I could see something interesting. Or maybe the loop didn't reach high in the air. 
It was something I could try. I placed my bag at the base of the boulder tree and started to climb. Watch my bag for me, champ. You can have the water and snacks if you want, I told Ellie and started to climb. I wasn't much for climbing, but the branches were thick and close together, so it was pretty easy. This tree was almost made for it. I slowly made my way up, getting covered in leaves, sap and scratches from the bark. I didn't know when I should stop. I made the mistake of looking down and froze in fear for a few seconds. I learned in that moment, I was afraid of heights, but I had to keep going. I had to get out of there and find a way to get Ellie out of the woods. I don't know how long it took, but I made it nearly to the top and where I could no longer grab branches to support my weight. I looked around seeing nothing special, but I was still in the tree so maybe the loop didn't reach that high up. I took a risk and climbed one more branch when the world went dark. I realised that the sun had set in the blink of an eye. I looked up at a starry sky through the branches before an immense force suddenly knocked me from my perch. It felt like an invisible hand had grabbed around me and ploughed my body through all the branches I'd just climbed. The pain was nothing I'd ever felt before. I heard my legs break before I felt it. My ribs were crushed and a knock to my skull thankfully making my world dark. When I woke up, I was on the bottom of the trail right next to Ellie, who I'm pretty sure was just poking me with a stick. I screamed, sitting up, passing my body, looking for what was broken, only to find myself in one piece. I was breathing hard, looking frantically around to see I was back in the grey light of the trail, and my body healed. Not even the tree sat remained. I guess that didn't work, I said with a small laugh, even though I wanted to cry. My body was healed, but I still had the memory of the pain. It was a good idea. I don't think I've ever seen someone find an opening of the loop before. Ellie commented in a small, soft voice. He'd spoken about the loop. I no longer could doubt it was happening. The whole thing was now in the open, and we needed to talk about it. I'm stuck in a loop, I said slowly, still not fully believing it. Yes, you are, Ellie said with a nod. He was making doodles in the dirt with his stick, as if the strangest thing wasn't happening, like all of this was normal. I stared at him, and the sticks he had placed in a circle in the dirt, and a thought suddenly came to me. I'm stuck, but you're not. The sticks Ellie had been playing with remained when my phone was returned. It may have been because Ellie hadn't moved, but his wording made me clue in. He didn't agree we were both stuck, just myself. I pulled my pack next to him and patted on it, giving him a place to comfortably sit. Alright champ, take a seat and let's figure out what's going on. With both of us and unlimited time, I'm sure we can figure out why this is happening. You're not going to accuse me of trapping you? Ellie said, and the surprised tone in his voice was the most emotion he'd showed since we met. Nope, you don't seem the type. I could have sworn I saw his ears turn a little red through his hair. He sat on my backpack. Knees tucked inside a sweater, making him look very small. But for the small child he was, I knew in that moment, he might not be human. But lucky for myself, he had the answers to what was going on. Humans are born to die. Most creatures are. You can't understand an endless existence. Not truly understand it. If you did, you would become something else. That's the purpose of this loop. For you to become something else. In this place, you cannot die. You just remain for your mind to rot or turn. The one that created this place reproduces this way. If your mind turns and you become something else, it twists your flesh into something the same as itself. The ones who cannot make the change are eaten. The loop keeps the victims fresh. I assume the missing children on the trail were taken for food. Children don't often manage the change. I got goosebumps listening to Ellie's words. I hated the idea of those two kids being trapped the way I was, stuck in a forever loop, not understanding what was happening, and not being able to get out. I was lucky enough to come across someone to explain things to me. Ellie kept talking, so I pushed my thoughts aside to listen. Humans cannot break this loop. I am not human, so I cannot be trapped here. But I cannot break this loop to save you. It goes against what I am. I cannot save a human from a creature of the night. 
I, however, can make this offer to you once. I can turn you into something else. Once you come to my side, I can save you. I can remove you from these, from these woods. I cannot guarantee your humanity, though. You may end up as something far worse than the creature that has trapped you here. Ellie stared at me with those intense eyes. It felt like the forest was closing in on me, waiting to hear my answer. I could either become a creature after suffering through an endless amount of time, or take him up on his offer and become something else, or take a huge risk. No thank you, I said with a small smile. To my surprise, Ellie smiled back. A small one, but still a smile. I knew he wasn't going to offer to turn me again, but I also knew Ellie was here for a reason. Maybe that reason would get me out of his mess. It's best for you to stay silent as I take care of why I came here. I cannot promise your life. I need to summon the creature who made this loop and speak with it. It may eat you, Ellie said as he stood up. I watched him as he walked to the middle of the trail. He stood waiting for me to nod and give him a small wave, telling him I was ready to maybe die in the next few minutes. Not much else I could do about it. He gave me a nod back then stomped down hard on the dirt, packed ground. I thought I heard some sort of hollow echo and the faintest silver light coming from him when he stomped. My body sensed the creature before I saw it. Every hair on the back of my neck stood on the end and my hands started to shake. I had never been so scared in my life. I would honestly rather be thrown from a tree a hundred times than be sitting on the trail when the creature showed itself. It was enormous, black mass that flickered through the trees like a ghost. Its white glowing eyes and clawed black hands looked solid enough though. Wrapping one hand around a tree that looked so big it could easily rip that tree from the roots. Even though it was massive, its voice was barely a whisper. It was right in front of us and yet I could barely get a good look. It was like my eyes refused to focus on the thing and I was glad for that. What creature has wandered into my forest? It reached out a large claw towards Ellie who stood firm. Even in my state, I wanted to run out and protect him. The claw stopped right in front of his face when Ellie started to speak. You have created far too many children. Your limit was two. You are taking too many humans to feed them and I suspect you took this other human to create a new Ellie's strong words were cut off by a rasping laugh from the woods that made my skin crawl. This forest is mine. I can take as many children as I like. Now be gone. The massive claw came down to crush poor little Ellie and I shot to my feet. I was far too slow, but my concern was not needed. The moment was ghastly claw came down, it exploded in a silver mist. The creature let out a shriek of pain and darted further back into the woods nursing its wound. Ellie had not moved and his back was turned to me. I could feel he was very angry. You cannot be, the monster hissed with a voice full of hate. The Silver King is dead. I can never die and you have insulted me beyond going past your child limits. As a punishment you must kill the most recent ones you have created. You must also break the loops of the humans you have trapped. Humans that are most suited to be returned to their world are just to live peacefully. You'll go hungry for a while, but be thankful for your life. The monster hissed and darted back and forth between the trees, considering what to do. It clearly wanted to kill Ellie, but it couldn't. I didn't believe that Ellie, the small child before me, was a scarier monster than the dark thing in the woods. But the proof was the thing not attacking. With more pacing and hateful hissing, it agreed. Oh, thank you, my dear Silver King, for sparing my life this night. I shall never forget it. Never. I had never heard such pure hate before. It made me feel sick just listening to that dreadful voice. I had no idea how Ellie stood so still with them directed towards him. He was a tough kid, it seemed. I expected something special to happen, but I just blinked and everything returned to normal. It was dark, meaning the sun had finally set. Ellie stood in the same spot, the monster in the woods gone. 
I checked my phone, finding not finding it working, but I didn't use it to call for help. I knew I was safe to walk to the end of the trail and out of the woods. Ellie looked at me with a hard to read look on his face. It lightened when I offered my hand to him so we could continue the way we'd started. Even in the dark, I saw his face flush a little. He was a big, important figure among very scary creatures. I don't think he often was treated like the child he was and appreciated the gesture. I wish I'd spoken to him on our walk. I didn't know what to say after everything I'd seen. I was going through ideas in my head when I saw something else on the trail in front of us. My throat closed and I felt fears coming to my eyes. The missing children stood alone, holding hands and looking very scared. I let go of Ellie's hand to run over to the poor lost kids. I checked them over, finding them to be safe and perfectly fine. But when I looked back, Ellie was gone. I was a bit suspicious bringing two of the missing kids out of the woods. Two kids that should have been dead and looked the same as they did when they'd gone missing. But I had a solid alibi when they hadn't been on the trails. One was me on camera buying gas and the other with me with 10 other volunteers when the little had gone missing. Some people thought I was working with the ones who had taken them, but with no proof, the matter was dropped. No one could explain what happened, and I was not offering my strange tale. The kids say they'd just been stuck in one spot for a long time and didn't get hungry. Since they were so young, the police didn't know what to make of it. The case came to a standstill, but most people were just happy the kids were found. Since then, I've wondered about Ellie. I can't help but think how he's doing out there and if he's safe. Of course, he is safe. He seems like a big deal, but I can't help myself. I've been looking, trying to find any mention of him, but so far, nothing. If you run into him out there, please trust him and treat him nicely. He has a tough job. And please tell him Hugh says hello and wants to know he's doing all right. <laughs> Thank you.